Welcome back to 8701. Uh, with this lecture, I'd like to introduce the major players of this class, the particles, fundamental, fundamental particles, um, but also some of the compound particles which play a role in the discussions we'll have over the next weeks. Um, for centuries, um, people believed that uh, atoms are the most fundamental constituents of matter. The name atom comes from the Greek atomic, which means not divisible. Um, but as you know today, electrons and nuclei build an atom. Um, but even those nuclei are not fundamental particles. As you see nicely here in this picture, the nuclei is built out of, and can be built out of many neutrons and protons. And even those protons and neutrons are not fundamental particles. A proton, for example, is depicted here, um, has three components or three constituents, um, two up to up quarks and one down quark. A neutron then is built out of one down quark and two up quarks. Um, it is kind of important to understand and appreciate the size of those um, particles, um, specifically the difference in size. Um, comparing here an atom, a typical atom, of the size of 10 to the minus 10 meters, uh, and co that compares to a, a nucleon, which can be a few 10, 10 to the minus 15 uh, meters. When we talk about a proton, we typically like to use um, units of femtometers, which is 10 to the minus, 10 to the minus 15 meters. Um, the tremendous size difference also explains the finding of the famous gold foil experiment, which found that an atom basically is made out of nothingness, empty space, and a very dense charged core, the nucleus. So you see this very much in this picture and by comparing this order of magnitudes. Not shown in this picture here is a particle um, which doesn't really like to interact with anybody else uh, or which the forces it's interacting with are so weak that it cannot be found. And that is the neutrino. A neutrino is not that different from an electron or from a quark. It's just that the interactions it participates in um, are only the weak force as we understand today. Um, just to be clear, uh, when I talk about a fundamental particle, I talk about a particle um, which has no size. Uh, it's infinitely, infinitely small. Um, it has no substructure, meaning it cannot be broken up in constituents. Um, and it can also not be excited. Having said that, uh, this is our current understanding of nature and of those particles. Uh, experimentally, we can only probe those particles to a certain scale or size. And uh, we'll talk later about how precisely we actually do know that a quark is fundamental or an electron is fundamental. In this discussion here, in most of the lecture, I'll talk about the standard model in particle physics. Um, it is a fact that our measurements and uh, our experimental findings are in uh, fantastic agreement with this very predict predictive theory. Um, the only uh, Experimental deviation from this is the fact that we measured the mass of neutrinos to be non-zero. Um, as a consequence, you know, you could say the standard model is broken or we found physics beyond the standard model, but it is actually rather straightforward to extend the standard model to accommodate neutrino masses. So we can, you know, just forget about this small fact and assume that the standard model described nature as we know it. In the last week of this class, we'll talk about motivation why we think that the standard model in fact is not complete. And one of the uh, big drivers here is the fact that we cannot observe, uh, describe all of the ob observations in nature, specifically the observation of dark matter with uh, the standard model in particle physics, but that's for a later day. Um, looking into some more detail, um, the standard model has, uh, sets of particles. Uh, some are particles which carry forces and some are matter particles. The ones who carry forces are all 
spin one bartic particles and their bosons with that. Um, we have in the standard model described three interactions, the electromagnetic interactions, which you all know from light electromagnetic um, phenomena, uh, chemistry, you know, the, the atoms behavior or molecule is determined by electromagnetic interactions. And then there's a strong interaction. The name already tells you that it's strong. It's very strong. Um, the force carrier here is the gluon. Each glu uh, the gluons, there's eight, um, and that differentiated differentiate by um, the so-called color, um, which is an interesting effect. And then there is a, the weak interaction um, carried by the W boson and the Z boson. They are different in their own right because they carry mass. They are massive particles and they're actually quite heavy, about 80 to 100 times as heavy as a, a proton. Um, the weak interaction is responsible for neutron decays, also responsible for the burning of the sun. And in our nuclear physics part, we'll talk in detail about what that all means. The gravitational effects are not considered in the standard model. They're very, very weak. Uh, compared to the strengths of the other forces we'll discuss here. Um, but it's technically very difficult to actually accommodate uh, gravity as part of a quantum field theory. And therefore, we, can, we, we will uh, simply ignore this fact. And there's yet another reason why we can consider the standard model to be incomplete as a model or theory describing nature. The metaparticles themselves are all fermions. They have spin half, and they come in three different generations. The only difference between one generation to the next is the fact that those particles have different mass. In other words, their coupling to the Higgs field is different, and that's the only difference between those particles. There's consequences out of this. Uh, for example, heavier particles can decay into lighter particles. Uh, we differentiate between the quarks and leptons. Quarks partake in the strong interactions, while leptons are neutral in the strong interaction. Um, and then we have seen neutrinos already and electron type particles. Um, electron type particles, the charged leptons, they have electric charge, so they couple to photons, while neutrinos don't. Um, I show you here again one of those stri striking differences. Um, an electron is nine times 10 to the minus 31 kilogram heavy. Um, we like to talk about units in a different class, um, but that's 511 keV. Why the muon is about 200 times heavier and even heavier the tau lepton. And as I said before, that allows the tau lepton and also the muons to decay into lighter particles. Uh, we'll talk about this. Uh, this and how, how, how we can use those decays in order to learn about the standard model later. And then there is the Higgs boson. Um, and again, the Higgs boson discovered in 2012 space, uh, plays a very special role in the, in the standard model. We talk about the Lagrangian, the theory um, which describes the standard model or which is you know, the, the basic, there's a theory itself uh, later on. In this theory, we introduce a potential which is shown here. It's, it's, um, Mexican head, if you want potential. And uh, what you see here is that in this picture, that the lowest energy state of this potential breaks a symmetry. So it's away from the zero point. Um, and that symmetry breaking then gives mass to the W and the Z boson, which I was describing before. And the coupling of the metaparticles to the Higgs field gives mass to those particles. All this on a later date. I thought here I also give you how CERN actually depicts um, the Higgs boson. Uh, July 4th is a special day in the US, but it's also a special day at CERN because the Higgs discovery has been announced on this day. And at CERN, typically, uh, the menu is enriched on that day by the Higgs boson itself in form of pizza, which um, takes the shape of event displays, displays of proton-proton collisions into the Higgs boson and then further decays. We look at some of those event displays also later. So that completes the elementary, the fundamental particles of the standard model, uh, the particles which describe almost everything around us. So we have seen the charged and neutral leptons, we have seen the quarks, we have seen the force carriers with the W, Z boson, the proton and the gluon, and the Higgs boson, which 
you know, it's kind of the, the very special particle holding this all together. Um, an interesting point here is again, looking a little bit at history and when those particles have been discovered um, and also when those particles have been uh, explained. Um, and I don't want to read this all to you. Um, you see that you know the earliest discovery was a discovery by J.J. Thompson of the electron and the latest, the completion of the particles in the standard model, um, the Higgs boson in 2012. Interesting for the Higgs boson, the time between the theoretical discovery by Peter Higgs and friends um, was about 50 years before the experimental discovery. But then there's also composite particles. So the things around you are all composite particles. Um, here we can uh, differentiate between mesons and baryons. Uh, mesons are particles which are made out of quarks and antiquark pairs, or the bound states, and they're bosonic because you add spin half part, two spin half particles together. One example is a pion, which is made out of up quarks and down quarks that can be charged in neutral pions. Um, and the, the zoo of particle uh, increases quite quickly uh, if you then consider that it's not just up and down quarks making those particles, but you could add strangeness to that, meaning a strange quark. And so you see here in this, in this picture, um, uh, the, the mesons, the pions, etas, but also then the neutrals and charged particles with different charges, and then kaons, which are particles which have one S quark in addition to an up quark and down quark. And then there's baryons, they're made out of three quarks. We have already seen the proton and the neutron, but also here you can see a uh, different configuration. We'll uh, introduce a concept of isospin. You can see here the proton and the neutron and then strangeness being added with one or two components of strangeness. And then there's this isospin component as well. This situation becomes complex very, very quickly, but we'll look at this in more detail. And then again, putting those bound states together, bound states of uh, protons and neutrons through the strong force gives us a rich table of nuclei or an isotope table. Um, here you can describe nuclei by the number of protons, which is typically called Z, and the number of neutrons, which is typically called N. Um, the sum N by Z is the atomic mass. You know, each proton and a neutron are about one GeV heavy, and then the atomic mass is simply the sum of them. So you already know explicitly how heavy your isotope might be. Um, we'll talk about the fact that those masses are not quite uh, the sum of the masses later because there's some binding energy involved. Um, and then isotopes can be stable or unstable. They can decay in various processes. You can combine them. Um, it's very interesting to understand and how they're actually being created in our solar system or the universe in general. So with this, I'd like to conclude this, um, this part of the introduction. So we have seen um, the major players of, of this course with the fundamental particles, but also the compound particles, meson, baryons, and nuclei. Um, and there's a few more points in the introduction before we then dive into uh, a little bit more of the theoretical discussion.